today, I'm going to be attempting to answer a bunch of full stack web development interview questions. This is the first interview I've attempted in many, many years. So it's going to be really interesting to see how I do. And best of all, you can play along with this video to try to answer the questions yourself to see how prepared you are for a full stack web developer job. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And today we're going to be using 30 seconds of interviews to practice a bunch of different interview questions. They have a bunch of different questions from easy all the way to hard and they cover a bunch of different categories from HTML, CSS, React, Node, and so on. So you get kind of like the full stack experience. And also I want you to try to answer these yourself. So as soon as I get to the question, pause the video and try to think of the answer yourself before I tell you what my thoughts are. Also, I wrote a really quick program that'll allow me just to go to a random question and it's going to go to that question and then I can answer that question. So this one right here, what is memoization? Memoization, I actually have an entire video on, so hopefully I can answer this well. I'll link the video if you're interested. But essentially, memoization is the idea of caching different information. Let's say that you're calling the function called sum. If you pass it the value two and the value three, the result is going to be five. Well, now let's say you call that sum function a second time and you pass it again the value of two and the value of three. Well, you already know that you're going to get the same result of five. So you can cache that value where you say, okay, given the inputs two and three, I know the result is always five. So just automatically return five instead of actually going through all the work of doing the addition. In this case, obviously there's no reason to cache that value because adding two numbers is super quick. But if you're doing something that's very slow, like making a network request, or you just have really complicated logic, it may make sense to use memoization. So that way you don't have to recalculate that value every single time you call the function if you call it with the same parameters and you know that the function always returns the results. So let's see what they actually say. So they say it's the process of caching the output of function calls so that subsequent calls are faster. That's essentially, yeah, exactly what I said. Calling with the same input will always give you the same output. So you just return the cast version. Here's an implementation. So yeah, that's essentially memoization. And like I said, I have a full video on this topic already. You can check it out linked in the cards and description. Let's move on to another random question here. This one is also in the hard category. So this one says, what is context? I'm going to just assume that this is a React question because it doesn't actually say because React does have a concept called context. Now, again, I have a video covering context in React, so I hope I get this question right. I'll link that video in the cards and description for you. I even have a mini course on it. But essentially, context is the idea of storing information inside of this global state object. It's not entirely global, but you essentially wrap your components in React inside of a context. And that context has information that you can access inside of any of those child components. So if you wrap your entire application inside a context, it's essentially global because all of your application has access to that context. Well, if you wrap like four components in your application inside this context, those four components have access to all of the information in the context. Now, the reason you want to do this is because if you have lots of components that use the same data, it makes sense to store it in one location instead of having to pass that through the props, which is called prop drilling. You can just store that in your context. So let's see, this is a React question. Good. So yeah, context provides a way to pass data through the component tree. So through all of those children without having to pass it through the props, which is the prop drilling method I just talked about. So for example, they say like authenticated user, locale preference, UI theme. Those are really good examples of like high level global context that you wrap your entire application in. So let's close that. Let's get another question. So far, two for two. I'm feeling pretty good. What's this one going to be? What are JavaScript data types? Okay, this is a little bit of an interesting question. It's one that you might see in an interview where they trick you up a little bit with terminology. I'm already being tripped up a little bit by the whole data types concept here. I'm guessing what they're trying to refer to are like, what are the types of data you can store in JavaScript? So this would be like a Boolean, a string, a number, an object, an array, that kind of stuff. That's maybe my initial guess. But that would be like primitive data types. So I guess when you think of a data type, what I would say is a data type is either going to be a primitive data type, like a Boolean or a string or a number. Those are like built into like the JavaScript code itself. And then there's also going to be other data types that's going to be like a date, for example, or a promise. Those are data types that are a little bit more involved. They're not actually like raw primitive data types, but they're like objects that represent a bunch of different data that are built into JavaScript, the actual language. Like they're built into the browser. And that's my idea of what a data type is, but we'll see. I'm sure I'm going to be wrong on this one. So it says, okay, ECMAScript standard defines seven data types, six of them being primitive, Boolean, null, undefined number, string, symbol, and one non-primitive data type. Okay, so they were asking what are the different data types. So I answered some of them. I said Boolean, number, string, object, but I didn't talk about null, undefined, or symbol. Symbol is a really interesting one. 
in that you're only going to use it like maybe 1% of your entire development career. So that's probably why most people don't even know it exists. It's also quite a bit newer than all these other data types. Okay, so I would say I'm two for three. I definitely got that one wrong. So let's try a new question here. Hopefully, here we go. We have one in the easy category. Hopefully I get this one right. So what is the difference between an element and a component in React? So this is just the idea between an element is like an anchor tag or a div or a span. It's just going to be some HTML element while a component is going to be the entire React component. So like in React, let's say that you create a component that's going to render out a to-do list. You have a to-do list component, and inside that component, you have a bunch of logic, you have some hooks, you have some state, and then inside of that, you render out some elements to the page. You might render a unordered list and with some list items in it, some anchor tags, and maybe there's a button. All those are going to be your elements, while the actual whole component itself would contain all your logic, that's going to be the component. This is my answer, let's see. So an element is a plain JavaScript object that represents a DOM node or a component. Elements are pure and never mutated and aren't cheap to create. Let's see what they give as an example here. Component is a function or a class. Components can have state, take props. So you know, that's the more complicated version. Um, let's see here. So we have a component, component element, DOM node element. Okay, so I guess they're referring to an element as something that also references a component. So an element is like the JSX version of your component, while the component itself is like the actual logic. I think that's what they're trying to say. Yeah. Not 100% sure though. So elements are immutable plain objects that describe the DOM nodes or components you want to render. Components can either be classes. Okay, yeah, that's essentially what they're saying. So like the element is the actual like JSX version of your component, while the component is the function itself. So the component is like the function or class, and the element is the actual node that you use inside of JSX. I'm going to give myself a half a point on that one. So we're at 2.5 out of 4, because I feel like I got that one mostly right, but just I didn't have all the semantics down for exactly what they're asking for. Okay, let's try another question here. What are fragments? So this is another one that I'm almost certain they're referring to React because React has fragments inside of it. And a fragment is essentially a way for you to crap code that returns multiple things inside of these fragments. So in React, when you return code or render out JSX, you need to return one single HTML element, just one element, whatever it is. It could be a component, it could be a string, it could be a div, but it has to be one element. If you want to return two elements, for example, two divs one after another, you need to wrap those inside of a fragment. And that way React is returning one thing, which is this fragment. And inside that fragment, it has these two divs. And then when it renders the code out to your page, it just removes the fragment. It pretends the fragment's not there and it'll just render those two divs. While if instead of using a fragment, you wrapped these divs inside of something like a section tag, now when you render out your code to the screen, it's going to have a section tag and inside that are going to be two divs. While if you use a fragment, there'll be no section tag at all. It'll just show two divs. So it prevents you from doing unnecessary nesting. Let's see here. Allow a, return, a component to return multiple elements without a wrapper. There we go. Exactly. So this is the syntax I'm most used to using is like these empty tags right here. That is a fragment. You can also say react.fragment. They both do the exact same thing. But this right here, this is kind of what I would write to use a fragment. That was a pretty simple one overall. Let's actually change our category here because we've done a lot of React questions. Let's try like a Node question. I'm much less familiar with Node. Let's try to get a random node question. Um, it looks like my get next question function that I wrote is not working. Let's just keep doing it until we get one here. There we go. Okay, we just got one. So this one, it says, how can you avoid callback hell? So callback hell is just the idea of having a bunch of callbacks inside of each other. As you can see here, we have a bunch of functions that are running inside of each other. The whole idea to avoid this is to either use promises or to use async await. So instead of taking a function that takes another function as an argument, you instead return a promise from this function, and then you can chain dot then methods afterwards. So you could have a bunch of dot then chaining, which is only going to be one level of nesting instead of multiple levels of nesting. That's how I would do this. You could also use async await, which is just syntax on top of promises. I actually have videos covering both these. I'll link them in the cards for you. Let's see what the answer is. So yeah, refactor the functions to return promises using async await is usually the best option. And here's their code version using async await. So you have an asynchronous function and it's awaiting each of those calls in order, which is much easier to read than this mess of code up here. There we go, that was that one. Let's try a different category here. Let's do, actually, let's just go back to all because that way my function will work properly and we'll run it again. And uh, here we go, what is a peer function? Okay, I love this question. This is a JavaScript question. But this is a really important question to understand if you're interested in functional programming. I actually have a video on pure functions, so I hope I can answer this. But essentially, a pure function is a function that takes in certain inputs, and it'll always return the same output every time you pass it the same inputs. 
So we talked about memoization at the beginning of this video, where like you memoize the inputs. So two plus two is gonna give you four. You save that when you pass in two and two, you get four, so you can cache that information. To do this caching with a memoization, you need a peer function. Otherwise the caching won't work because if you pass in two and two and sometimes you get five and sometimes you get four, obviously you can't memoize that value. So with peer functions, first of all, your inputs always have to return the same output. Think of like a math function. Every time you pass in two plus two, you always get four. Another important thing is you cannot have side effects. So let's say you call a function, it does two plus two and returns to four, but also it saves some data to the database. Well, that's not a peer function anymore because you're returning the same inputs and outputs, like the same input maps to the same output, but now you're doing a side effect of saving data to the database. This makes it no longer a peer function because peer functions cannot have side effects. I think there's a third thing that qualifies as a peer function, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. So I'm just gonna look at the answer to see. So a peer function satisfies these two conditions. Okay, it's only two. So you, the same input gives you the same output and it doesn't have any side effects. So as we can look here, we have some versions of impeer and peer function. So impeer, this is adding a random number. So every time you call it, it's different. This is mutating the array you pass in. For example, we're taking this array and adding this value to it. So it's changing our input and it's giving this the same output, but it changes our input, which is bad because that's a side effect. And here again, sort changes the input. So these three methods up here are just pure versions of them. Instead of using push, we're using concat because that doesn't actually modify the array. And we're just getting a brand new array every time. So we don't modify the array. Your functions, like I said, are something that are very important to understand if you're into functional programming. Even if you just want to write cleaner code, I recommend writing as many pure functions as you can because it'll make your code easier to test and easier to understand. Now, let's just try one more question. I think we got time for one more before this video gets too long. And if you enjoy this, let me know because I can make more videos like this for sure. There's tons of questions on the site. Here we go. What does the following function return? Uh, greet, return, and then it has this method message. So this is maybe a trick question. We'll see for sure. Okay, it is a trick question. So technically, this is going to return undefined. And that's because of how JavaScript handles new line statements. So you would think by looking at this, it's going to return this object right here. But what happens is JavaScript is looking at this code right here, and it sees that this is the end of the line. There's nothing after this return. The line just ends. So what's going to happen is it's going to say, okay, there's nothing on this line. It's as if you wrote return undefined semicolon. That's what this is going to read as. No show is going to return absolutely nothing. And all of this code, it's as if this code's not even here because it's after the return statement, it's never going to get run. So since JavaScript does take into account white space and not just semicolons, this is going to assume that this code right here is on a separate line than the code that you have for the return statement right here. So I think it'll return undefined. Yep, so they automatically insert semicolons, which is why you don't need semicolons. If you wanna know why I don't use semicolons, I have a whole video on it, I'll link in the cards and description for you. And as you can see, the compiler places semicolons after the return keyword, so it returns undefined without any error being thrown. So that is why you get this bug right here. Obviously, in 99.9% .9 of use cases, you're never going to write code that looks like this. And if you do, you're going to get weird syntax highlighting in your editor. And it's going to like gray out this code right here. So you're going to know for a fact this is a bad idea and like you shouldn't write code like this because it'll just look wrong in your editor. And obviously, it'll give you bugs. I'm not going to lie. I'm actually pretty happy with how I did. I didn't get a perfect score, but I mean, you're not expected to get a perfect score on these types of tests. They're pretty tricky. I'm curious, let me know in the comments how you did on this. Did you get all of them, none of them, somewhere in between? How did you stack up against me and against the other people in the comments? Let me know down below. Also, I mentioned a lot of videos that I have on different topics we covered in this video. So if you wanna check those out, I'll have some of them linked over here and the rest will be linked down in the description below. So make sure you go check those out. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.